Hello, everyone. My name is Shun Inoue with the Japan Foundation New York Arts and Culture Team. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we are pleased to present the second episode of our JFNY Literary Series, in which we invite notable writers of Japanese literature, their translators, to discuss their work, speak on the art of translation, and touch upon the current literacy in Japan. This has been made possible with the generous help of the collective Strong Women, Soft Power, formed by renowned translators, Allison Mark and Powell, Jenny Tapley Takemori, and Lucy North. They have kindly agreed to participate in this series as our curators. Today, we have invited author Sayaka Murata and translator Jenny Tapley Takemori. Murata-san is an Octagawa Prize winning writer and the author of Convenience Store Women and Earthlings. For our moderator, we have invited literary critic John Freeman. Our esteemed interpreter, Beth Ann Jones, will be providing interpretation from Japanese to English and vice versa. For those who have yet to read Murata-san's novels, Convenience Store Women and Earthlings, there's a link provided in the description below where you can get more info and order a copy for yourself from one of the vendors listed. Thank you, Shun-san. I am delighted to represent my fellow translators and members of the collective Strong Women Soft Power, Al Alison Markin Powell and Ginny Tapli Takemori, in the second of our series on Japanese literature in translation. My name is Lucy North. Sayaka Murata is a writer who truly needs no introduction. Following on from her huge hit, Convenience Store Woman, which sold phenomenally well in Japan and equally well around the world, Murata-san's novel Earthlings was published in the UK and the US in October 2020. It was chosen as one of Times' must-read books of 2020 and the New York Times' 100 Notable Books of the Year. It has also been long-listed for the Believer Book Award in the category of fiction. Ginny Tapli Takemodi is now best known as Sayaka Murata's translator into English, although she has translated over a dozen other writers. Her first translation of a work by Murata-san was Lover on the Breeze, a whimsical short story in which an inanimate curtain covets a romance. A Clean Marriage, a story about a happily sexless couple, soon followed, published in Granta. This hilarious short story, which defied all expectations of what a Japanese short story should be, was followed by Convenience Store Woman, and 2020 saw the publication of Earthlings, to glorious reviews. Today's moderator, John Freeman, is quite simply one of the preeminent book people of our time. A writer, anthologist, poet, essayist, and a public intellectual, his books include Dictionary of the Undoing, Tales of Two Planets, Stories of Climate Change and Inequality in a Divided World, and his latest collection of poetry, The Park. John was the editor of Granter until 2013, He's the founder of Freeman's, a literary biannual of new writing launched in 2015. For a number of years, he served as executive ed editor of Literary Hub. In March 2021, he will join Knopf as executive director. John will guide a conversation between Murata-san and Ginny. We will then be treated to the reading of an excerpt in both Japanese and English, followed by further discussion. I will then pop back on screen and we will have a Q&A session. And now I'm thrilled to hand things over to John Freeman. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you to the Japan Foundation for making this event possible. It's a great pleasure to be back in conversation with Saka Murata, who to my yardstick is one of the most vital and arresting novelists at work anywhere in the world today. I'm also very happy to be joined by Lucy and Allison, and especially Ginny Tapley Takamori, with whom I've worked with on several pieces by Sayaka in Freeman's, uh, in Granta, Literary Hub, and, and elsewhere. But really, we're here to talk today about Sayaka Murata's latest novel, Earthlings, which is a darkly lit fable about love, family, and the dangers and necessities of normality in contemporary Japan. As the book opens, our 11-year-old heroine Natsuki is at, is at odds with almost everyone in her life. The only people with whom she can confide 
are her cousin Yu and her best friend Piyot, a fuzzy toy who has explained to Natsuki that she hails from a faraway planet and has come to Earth to study Earthlings. As a magician herself, Natsuki takes this information in stride. When Natsuki explains these things to you, he doesn't judge her, but instead reveals that he too has often felt like an alien. During a visit to Yu's family village in a mountain town, the two children formalized their bond, promising each other discretion, safety, and devotion. Earthlings tells the heartbreaking tale of all the dangerous and persistently undercutting forces that a young girl like Natsuki may encounter as she challenges such a bond and the beliefs which undergird it. Following a terrible event in her childhood, the novel flashes forward 23 years. Natsuki sees the world now as a factory for reproduction and utility. She sees love as one of the cruelest forms of control. She has married a fellow resistor to these forces of normality, but other forces will call her back to that mountain town and her long ago past and force her to reckon with the difference between survival and living. Please join me in welcoming the author of this magical and beautiful book, Sayaka Murata. Murata-san, one of the most memorable phrases I came across in this book is said by Natsuki in her adulthood. She says, normality was contagious and exposure to the infection was necessary to keep up with it. I wonder if you can talk to us about this in the context of your book, as in, what are the parts of what is normal that seem so strange to Natsuki? And what are the systems which disseminate this virus of, Nats of normality in Natsuki's eyes?え、I'd like to um, follow up on that question. Um, the virus in the book is both metaphorical uh, and actual, but since we're speaking of viruses and virality, we're obviously living through uh, a pandemic in which the contagion is, is not a metaphor, it is an actual thing. Obviously, that has been a terrible period for many people around the world, but it also highlights some of our habits, uh, some of our ways of speech, some of our assumptions. Before we get into your book, Murata-san, could you talk to me about your experience of the pandemic and what parts of society it is made more visible to you. So, this is the first time that we have a lockdown in the world. 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 We have a l o また私たちは部屋に閉じこもる生活を送っています。と私が一番感じたのは、誰が人がなんか情報のカプセルの中にそれぞれの情報のカプセルの中にいてどんどん分裂していくような気がしました。親しい友達と同じ価値観や考え方で喋っていたのが例えばその友達はあるラジオのニュースをものすごく聞いていて私はインターネットをたくさん見てしまったとしたら全く違う情報のカプセルに閉じ込められてしまうマスクをどれくら
私たちになってバラバラにの情報のカプセルの中で違う同じ時間なのに違う違う世界を見ているようなそういう感覚がずっと続いていますなのでとても孤独孤独な時間でした I, I, I second that feeling.、Um, that brings me to my next question.、Um, Natsuki is a very lonely character in many ways. She feels like an outcast. Her family is not very supportive of her, they don't listen to her. Her mother is physically abusive.、Um, so her life, as it, as it is, is, is quite painful、um, and isolated. And one of the ways that she Deals with a world that's hostile to her,、um, one that's trying to control her body, a theme we'll get to later, is to develop this rich imaginative world, a mythology which involves Piyut,、um, this kind of stuffed animal, and the planet that Piyut comes from. It feels like a way of coping with a world that doesn't believe her, that doesn't listen. And I found it very interesting in the first half of the book to see this belief system. Of Natsuki's、uh, in this planet in Piot's world, why Piot has come to Earth, juxtaposed with the Oban festival and its conjuring of ghosts.、Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you hope the reader would gain from the juxtaposition of these two belief systems, Natsuki's and, and that of the Oban festival. So, yes, I think. 何か言おうとしてるというよりかは描きたかったんだと思います。夏木はそれこそ自分で作り上げた宗教の世界、空想の世界、まあ、人間は誰でもある程度そうだと思うんですが、自分で作り上げた信仰のせ中にいて、彼女が信じるものをずっと追いかけている、信じている、祈っている。でもその人間たちが集まって村長野という長野の中の小さな村で得られるやり方でご先祖様を呼んだりそれを重ねたかったんだと思います彼女の小さな教会と大きな村の少し大きな教会とそれってもう一つ世界が信じている家族とか愛とかはとにあと家族や愛とか夫婦が愛し合って増えるとかそういうものへの信仰もっと大きな信仰その3つの信仰を重ねて描きたかったんだと思います。This is a question for Ginny.、Uh, we've worked together on many short stories by Murata san, all of them interrogating one belief system after another.、Uh, I was so impressed in the first part of this novel that you could、um, describe、uh, in Murata san's language、um, without a single footnote the unfolding of the, of the Oban festival.、Um, and I wonder if you could talk about the challenges a section like this presents versus,、um, say, Natsuki's、uh, um, personal world or private faith、um, versus, say, Other things I think that are more represented in Western culture of Japan and in particular of Tokyo life, the sort of brightly lit shops of which convenience store woman represented one, and the sort of a motosando stylish life, which、um, we see in passing in other stories by Murata san. What, what does translating something like, the, like this Ilbon section present to you as a challenge?、Mm. Yes. Well, I think,、um, I mean, that first whole first section of Earthlings in Akashina is just, it's kind of like a magical world almost、um, for the reader. And it's quite lyrical in a way as well. And it's, it's very, very beautiful, I think. I, I was so drawn in when I first read the book by this whole first section. And really, I think. Um, Sayaka's writing is so very, very descriptive that I follow it quite closely and I don't need to elaborate 
much, but there are certain things, for example, when the children go down to the river to meet, you know, to bring the ancestors back, maybe I have to um, clarify a couple of things there. Um, and they, they take the flame back to the house. And there in the house on the altar, you've got these two animals uh, um, made out of a aubergine, uh, an eggplant and a cucumber with chopsticks for legs. And of course, all Japanese people know what these are. So, you know, like anybody wouldn't, you know, you, nobody, no Japanese reader would question this, but for English readers, I mean, they're not going to have a clue what they mean. And so there I just slip in a little explanation about how, you know, the horse is to, you know, help the ancestors get the get home quickly and the cow takes them back slowly, like delays them their return to the other world. Just little things like this. And I really, for a, for a novel like Earthlings, I really don't want to use footnotes. It really breaks up the reading experience. So I, in that case, I will just slip in a little, um, a little explanation in. But most of the time, I don't really need to do that because I, you know, the writing is so very descriptive in the first place. Mm. Ratasan, I have a follow-up question. Um, before I'd like to ask you to read, uh, Jenny just used the word dreamy to describe how this first opening passage feels, which is so very apt, Ginny. Um, it's like being enchanted into a magical forest. And uh, it feels like uh, this book is looking at the, the ways that enchantment can, can um, save us and it can also lead us towards things which are harmful to us. Um, and I wonder if you have anything you could say about uh, being a child and the, the, the need for and the receptivity to enchantment um, as a, as a way of existing and how this book is comparing those forms of um, enchantment to the enchantments that um, we simply accept later as adults.そう それをしている。そういう人はきっとたくさんいると思うんです。なので時が経っても大人っていう大人っていう生き物の形の中に大人っていう形みたいなものの中に吸い込まれないでずっと夢の力で戦っている夢の力でサバイブしているそういう人を描
。よし、そろそろいらっしゃっただろう。ちょうちんに火を移せ、ひょうた。いらっしゃったというので、あみちゃんがひょわっと変な声を上げた。大声を出したらだめだよ。ご先祖様がびっくりしちゃうからね。とおじさんに言われ、私は唾を飲み込んだ。わらからそっとちょうちんへと火が移された。火のついたちょうちんは、ヨータ君が持った。よろよろとしながら、火を消すなよというおじさんの言葉に従って、用心深く家まで提灯を持っていく。おじさん、ご先祖様はあの火の中にいるの照吉おじさんに聞くと、おじさんはうなずいた。そうだよ、あの火を目印についてきてくださってるんだよ。提灯を持ったヨータ君が、縁側から座敷に入るとおばさんたちが出迎えてくれた。気をつけて、消さないようにね。陽太くんは励まされながら座敷の奥まで進んだ。陽太くんは本棚までそろそろと歩き、おじさんが火をろうそくに移した。本棚の上には、ナスとキュウリが割り箸で手足をつけられてうつんばいになっている。ご先祖様が乗るからと、昼間、アミちゃんとユリちゃんが作ったのだ。これでいい。この日のところにご先祖様がいるんだよ。夏希ちゃん、もちろうそくが小さくなったら交換してね。火を消さないように。消えるとね、目印がなくなってご先祖様が困っちゃうからね。はい。テーブルを見ると、父たちはもう座り込んで飲み始めていた。男たち、女たちと別れて、男たちは酒を飲み、女たちはせいせいと料理を作って運んでいるのだった。私と姉は子供たちの席に座った。テーブルの上には山菜や煮物が大皿で並んでいた。ハンバーグ食べたい。陽太くんが叫び、そんなものあるかと父親の照代少子さんに頭を叩かれていた。テーブルには稲子の佃煮が乗っていて、その横をバッタが走っていた。陽太捕まえろ。陽太くんはバッタを器用に両手で捕まえて逃がそうとした。バカ、網戸開けるな。虫が入ってくる。じゃあ、雲にあげてくる。私はそう言って立ち上がり、生きたままのバッタを陽太くんから受け取った。台所へ行き、雲の巣にそっとバッタをくっつけた。バッタは少し羽を震わせるだけで、激しい抵抗はせるに、雲の糸に絡まった。ごちそうだね。後ろをついてきた優が言った。こんな大きいの食べるかな。雲は突然引っかかってきた巨大な餌に戸惑っているように見えた。私たちはテーブルに押さり、お皿の裏の上の稲子を口に運んだ。今頃、雲もバッタを食べているのだろうかと思うと、なんだか変な感じで、それでも稲子はサクサクとして甘く、私は2匹目を口の中に押し込んだ。夜が更けると、家の周り中が虫の声に包まれる。いびきをかいている子もいるけれど、外の生き物たちの方が人間よりよほどうるさかった。少しでも明かりをつけると網戸に虫がびっしりとついてしまうので、部屋は真っ暗にしてあった。普段子供部屋で明かりをつけて眠っている私は、少し怖くて布団にしがみついた。すまの向こうには優がいる。そう思うと気持ちが落ち着いた。人間ではない命が窓のすぐそばまで押し寄せてきていた。人間ではない生き物の気配の方が大きい夜は不思議で少し怖いけれど、野生の自分の細胞がうずいているような感じがした Thank you very much, Zach and Murata. It's so lovely to hear you read from the book.、Um, and now, Jenny、uh, will read to us from the English that she translated. All of us children followed Uncle Teruyoshi. At the river, he would light the fire to welcome the spirits of our ancestors on their annual visit home for the Obon Festival. Yu was carrying an unlit paper lantern, and I had a flashlight. The Akashina Mountains were in darkness. The river we had been splashing around in last summer was now so black it felt as though it would swallow us up. <clears throat> as, Uncle Yoshi,、uh, as Uncle Teruyoshi set fire to a bundle of straw on the riverbank, our faces glowed orange in its light. 
we did as uncle told us and faced the flames. Dear ancestors, please use this fire to guide you to us, Uncle Teruyoshi said. Dear ancestors, please use this fire to guide you to us, we all shouted in unison. As we stared at the burning straw, Uncle Teruyoshi said, Right then, they must be here by now. Light the lantern, Yota. When he said they were here, little Ami let out a strangled shriek. You mustn't shout, Uncle told her, you'll startle them. I gulped. The flame was gently transferred from the straw to the lantern. Yota picked it up and staggered slightly as he cautiously carried it to the house, obeying Uncle Teruyoshi's warning not to let the fire go out. Uncle, are the ancestors inside that fire? I asked Uncle Teruyoshi. He nodded, that's right. The fire guided them to us. As Yota carried the lantern onto the veranda and into the tatami room, the aunts came out to greet us. Careful now. Make sure it doesn't go out. At their urging, Yorta proceeded through to the end of the room where an altar had been set up specifically for Obon. Uncle Teruyoshi lit a candle from the flame in the lantern. On the altar were a cucumber and an eggplant, each with four legs made from disposable chopsticks. These represented the horse to bring the ancestral spirits quickly back home and the cow to slow their return to the other world, making them stay longer in the living world. Ami and Yuri had made them that afternoon, knowing the ancestors were on their way. There we are, he said. The spirits of our ancestors are now here around the flame. Natsuki, when the candle burns down, be sure to replace it, okay? Make sure the flame doesn't go out. Otherwise, the ancestors won't have anything to guide them and they'll be in trouble. Okay, I said. I looked at the table and saw that dad and my uncles had taken their seats and were already drinking sake, while the women rushed around preparing food and serving it up. My sister and I sat with the other children. On the table in front of us were large serving dishes of edible wild greens and stewed vegetables. I want a hamburger, Yota said loudly, and Uncle Teruyoshi slapped him on the head. A grasshopper hopped past a plate of soy simmered locusts on the table. Yorta, get rid of that. Yorta deftly caught the grasshopper in both hands and went to put it outside. Don't be silly, if you open the screen, lots of bugs will come in. Okay, I'll go feed it to a spider then, I said, standing up and taking the live grasshopper from Yorta. I took it to the kitchen and gently stuck it onto a cobweb. It offered no fierce resistance, just fluttered its wings slightly and became tangled in the spider's silk. What a treat for the spider, said you behind me. I wonder if it can eat something this big. The spider looked taken aback by the huge prey suddenly caught in its web. We went back to the table and started eating the locusts. I wondered whether the spider had started eating the grasshopper yet and then felt a bit queasy. Still, the locusts were sweet and crispy. I shoved another one into my mouth. As the night wore on, the house became enveloped in the noisy chirring of insects. Some of the children were snoring, but the creatures outside were a lot lo louder than we humans. If you left a light on, however dim, bugs would flock to the window screens, so the rooms were kept in absolute darkness. As I normally slept with a lamp on, I felt a little scared and clutched the quilt close to me. The thought of you sleeping just the other side of the sliding doors calmed me. Non-human lives jostled up against the window. The presence of non-human creatures was stronger at night. Strangely enough, though I was a little scared, I felt as though my own feral cells were throbbing. Thank you so much, uh, Ginny Tapley, Takamori, and Sayaka Murata for having written that passage. I love it so much. It reminds me how childhood feels, how everything is animate. You know, the birds, trees, the night. It can be a cozy feeling. Uh, and I think one strength of this book is how vividly it remembers the way that we see the world as children. Later on in the book, after some events, Natsuki makes a husband um, and comes to terms with a life with him. 
And he, she tells him stories about this village and he's enchanted in it, enchanted with it. Um, meantime, he tells her stories about growing up with an alien eye sort of at the heart of him, something that she starts to develop. And she, it's described sort of as a, a way of seeing society skeptically. Uh, as Anatsuki's husband believes, he's an alien to society and he's watching the way earthlings behave. And I guess I wonder if you could tell us when your alien eye awoke, if you believe you have one. And I wonder if you can tell me if you think people born biologically as girls have, have different alien eyes than those who were born as boys. So, I was a little bit of 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 a 汚れてしまった。私のレンズはそういうレンズになってしまっていた。うん、例えばビルを見ても人間の巣だとは思わない。大きくてすごいビルだなと思う眼差しがもう子供の頃気がつくと私の眼差しはもうその言葉で汚れ
to describe what they're doing as well. So I think there are lots of different levels of language um, that are being used here. And it is quite a fundamental part of the book, I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, Murat San, you described earlier um, Natsuki's uh, sort of magical power uh, being one of it. Uh, being, being the ability to escape her body, the, the ability to, to um, project her mind out of a situation. Um, as Ginny was speaking, I was recalling that this book revolves around two central interrogations, both conducted by family, one in the first half after Natsuki. Uh, and you have, have done something that all children do once they are alone um, and often um, desire, which is they, 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 well, they have some sort of sexual interaction. I don't wanna give everything away. And then in the second half of the book, um, the lack of sexual interaction forces a, a, um, a, a second interrogation from the family. And one thing that amazes me about this novel is how Natsuki's superpower is not simply escape, uh, that she uses her ability to leave her body to not just hover above it, watching it uh, do things or having things done to it. She also projects herself into the bodies of others so that she can imagine uh, what her cousin is thinking, um, what her uncle is thinking. Indeed, at one point she says of you watching him in an argument, submission had been a coping strategy for him as a child, I realized. We often call this empathy. Um, I wonder if you see that connection in the novel yourself, uh, as in escape not just being the ability to flee danger, but to enter into the subjectivity of another. So, so this is a very interesting question. I was thinking that the 何かをごまかすためとかそういう言葉が多くて頭の中の言葉の方がすごく上舌でずっとそこで考え続けている人ですだから多分うん多分いろんな人のことをすごく見ていて見つめることで見つめてその人の中に入って想像することでその人を知ることで自分を守ろうとしているところもあると思います。これは多分とても私自身に似ている部分かもしれないのですが、そういう想像の仕方をする女の子だと思います。だから、夫とか優とか、いろんな人の体の中に入って、その人のことを、その人の頭の中を知る。それは、うん、多分普通だったらそこに楽しさがあったり優しさがあったりするかもしれませんが夏木はもう少し追い詰められた切実,切実な状況でその魔法を使っているかもしれないです。Thank you very much,、uh, Murata さん。I could speak to you、um, for quite a A long time,、um, but I would like to bring、um, Lucy North back in, who has some questions for you, and also say a, a, a big thank you to, to Beth Ann for、um, interpreting this and giving me the opportunity to speak to you in this way.、Um, Lucy, please,、uh, please join us. Thank you. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for that conversation. Um, now we've come to the Q&A part of today's event,、um, for which we've gathered together.、Um, 
questions sent in from readers. Um, and I should say that we've received a lot of questions, including some from several celebrated translators and um, soft women, soft, soft, strong women, soft power have um, a couple of questions too. So my, my first question is for Murata San and there's a, a related one for Ginny. Um, and it's a question about forthrightness, um, convenience store woman and earthlings. And in fact, Faith, a short story that um, recently appeared in Granta have different heroines and the situations and stories are all different. But the one thing that the heroines all have in common is that they're very, very forthright to the point of being blunt sometimes. And in many ways, they're childlike. They have great awareness and great powers of observation. And these are, contribute to making them feel ill at ease in, in their society. Um, Murata, I wonder whether you'd care to comment on the issue of forthrightness, particularly as the stories are all set in Japan where correct social behavior, at least on the surface, seems to involve tact, um, which is so important for social cohesiveness and being indirect and being, consider being considerate of others. As novices into Japanese society, non-Japanese people are always being told that we have to be aware of the difference between honne and tatemai, true feelings and the way things must appear. We have to learn how to navigate our way between these. And how does the forthrightness of your heroines fit into that? And just before Murata-san answers that, for Ginny, I wonder whether you'd care to talk about the forthrightness in Murata-san's heroine and also how this affects the tone of the works. Surely the forthrightness um, affects the language you choose to translate certain phrases and also has a great part to play in humor. So, this is a good question. 主人公は大体そうなのですが、すごく不器用なのですね。すごく不器用で他のうん。もっと器用にやり取りをしてうまく人間をやっている人たちはもっと器用に率直ではない小倉と私の書いてる主人公たちはそれがうまくできない人が多いです。特に最近の作品では多いです。頭の中でもそうが付けないし、口に出す言葉もうまく嘘がつけない。それをわざと日本の社会のありがちな当たり前の会話、よくある会話から
maybe sometimes we might come up with something better or whatever. Um, but I, I'm very grateful to them for um, giving me that sort of leeway. Um, I'd say that her narrators tend to be very, very logical, non-emotional, um, non-judgmental, lacking in malice. Um, and that often contrasts with the other characters. Um, in Convenience Store Woman, for example, in a way it kind of echoed the Convini manual and in Earthlings it develops into the alien eye eventually. But I think it's this flatness of tone of the narrator that can be very unexpected and it contrasts with our own preconceptions and it contrasts with the other characters and that can make for some very, very funny situations. So for example, if I, um, in Convenience Store Woman at the beginning of the story, you have Keiko as a child um, in the park with a lot of mothers and other children. And there's a dead bird and everybody's going crying and saying how oh, poor thing, you know, you know, let's bury it and that. And Keiko just turns around and says, let's eat it. <laughs> and everybody's what? <laughs> But it's actually a very, very funny moment in the story um, because he was, comes across as very, very unexpected. Um, there are other, in Earthlings, for example, you have that scene which I found extremely funny, but it's um, when in the mountain, like back in the mountains, she's there with her husband who has just been back to Tokyo to do something quite bad with his family and his father has chased him back out to the mountains and is absolutely furious and he's going there chasing him around the house beating him up and Natsuki's just there watching what's going on and saying this is really like a tv drama you know what what they're doing is so much like a tv drama and she's even you is playing the role of a wife much better than me and you know trying to stop them from fighting and and um, you know, then her husband, Tomoya, sort of begs her to save him. And she says, do you really want me to save you? And she sort of sees this weapon in the, you know, this um, grass cutting scythe and sitting in the corner. And he follows her line of sight and said, oh, no, 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 actually, maybe not. <laughs> it's OK. And then they go back to being beaten up again. And it's, it's a really quite funny scene. Um, but it's Natsuki's flatness of tone that I think really brings out that humor a lot. Mm. And also like, for example, in A Clean Marriage, the, um, the sex scene in A Clean Marriage, which is actually with a machine, um, again, is like described in such, a, such flat tones, but it's absolutely hilarious when, you know, um, the poor husband is like working hard like with the help of the nurses and she's just lying there like just observing all of this like not feeling anything <laughs> it, it it's actually very amusing but again it's this mm -hmm. her super logical view observant view and flatness of tone that i think really brings out that humor mm. Well, my next question is uh, um, involves huge change, and it's sort of harrowing to ask, actually. But um, I, I guess I'd like to address it to Ginny, but if um, Murata san cares to come in after, that would be wonderful as well. And it's a question about uh, writing taboo and embodiedness, and particularly the embodiedness of the translator. And the question relates to the scene of sexual abuse so with the teacher, or rather rape that occurs in, in Earthlings. Uh, we had a couple of questions from translators about this scene. And I'd like to borrow the voices first of Susan Bonofsky, who is a translator from German, and then of Valerie Henichuk, a translator and a passionate advocate of translation to, um, to ask this question. So first of all, Susan, um, 
The rape of a minor, as depicted in the novel Earthlings, is such a traumatic and taboo encircled topic. Were there aspects of the scene and its descriptions that had to be adjusted to account for how such things are talked about or not talked about in the two linguistic contexts? And did it take a psychological toll on you as the translator to work with such a grisly, with such grisly scenes? And the second related question from Valerie. I loved Convenience Store Woman with its unforgettable heroine. Earthlings also deals with being an outsider in a highly conformist society, but with so many more disturbing elements to the story. The brokenness of being abused, translated into specific corporeal brokenness of the mouth, of the ear, this all made me weep as I read the novel. How do you as a translator cope with having to deal with such images, struggling to describe them this way, then that way, in order to find the right words and phrasing to represent that embodiment of the heroine's suffering? It strikes me that this must have impacted you too in an embodied way. Mm, that's a very interesting question. Um, Yes, as a reader, many of the scenes made me cry as well, reading them. But when I'm translating, I, I'm using my analytical brain a lot. So a bit like, you know, Natsuki has an out-of-body experience while she's experiencing this rape. Um, in a sense, when I'm translating, I have something similar, you know, like I'm, I'm detached from myself and I'm analysing what's going on here. and. You know, I'm thinking about things like Natsuki's innocence and her lack of outrage at what's happening to her and her fear and revulsion as well. And you know, how to get these kind of things across. Um, but I think if I make readers weep for her, then I succeeded in the translation maybe, which makes me happy. But I don't, um, I think also because it's fiction, um, maybe it, Maybe if I was translating nonfiction on this sort of subject, I would feel it much more viscerally. Um, but in fiction, it, um, it is, it's, it's more for me a question, I have to empathize with her and get it across, but I don't feel that it really damages me to do that. And I think it is because I have this sort of separation of my emotions while I'm translating, focusing on analyzing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ask because translation is in, involves such empathy, has to involve such empathy. Um, you know, to be a good translator, you have to have a lot of empathy. So, and actually, even while I was practicing asking this question last night, you know, I found myself um, crying, mm -hmm. um, thinking about the scene. Yeah. Um, and I've often found myself crying when I translate my own stuff. Uh, when it involves trauma. So, you know, you sort of have to relive yeah. the trauma that is being described as you work it through your brain. And, um, yeah. yeah. But that's true. It is true. Um, but there is a difference in that it's, it's not happening to me personally. Yeah, so, um, mm. Mm. so yes, it is painful and it is, um, it's extremely sad and it's, and I cry too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is really horrible, but my job is to get this across for the readers. And that's what I try to focus on as much as possible and I you know, and try to capture it as best I can which involves a lot of close reading and close analyzing of exactly how it's 
you know what's what's going on and how the language is um being used here but but yeah i don't think i feel um permanently scarred by it <laughs> mm. in, in that sense but probably all the translations i've done yeah, i mean all of them are still inside me somewhere i guess but I also wonder how it is for Sayaka-san when she's writing these scenes. So, yes, I think it's a very sad scene. This novel is quite a last scene, but it's quite grotesque. But that scene was not so sad, but it was not so sad. But the scene of a woman who was in a bad way was really sad. 本当に苦しかったけれど、どれほど人の心を壊すのかっていうことを書くならとことん書かなければいけないと思って感情に流されないようになるべく冷静に書きましたでも何か物すごく傷ついたというよりかは何か自分の中にどうじくの先生から少しは、少しは <笑> Thank you. Well, my next um, question, possibly my final question, can be directed to all three of our speakers today, Murata San, Ginny, and John. Um, and it relates to the issue. It's a, it's a question of whether having the sustaining fantasy of Popin Popobia uh, is enough. Um, and for this, I'm, I'm going to quote a question that came to us from Frank Wynne, who is a translator from French, Spanish, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I'll read out what he, what he sent us. He says, what I most loved about the book was the way in which childhood voices, not just Natsuki, but you, morph into adulthood. How they are transformed by trauma, expectation, pressure, to shrug off all sense of the world being a sweet place for something that is pragmatic and bleak. I would like to ask both Murata-san and Ginny how those voices are created and, involve, and evolve in their minds and whether even in extremis, even when hope seems vain, the idea of popin popobia is enough to sustain people bowed and broken by life, to sustain what the French philosopher Pascal called the thinking reed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wonder who should go first. It's, it's basically, is the fantasy of, is it enough to protect oneself by, with dreams and fantasies? Is it sufficient? So, this is it. この、この本にはもしかしたら現実よりも広いくらいこの世界を作り上げてそこに住んでいるので、多分心をガードするには十分な広さを夏木は作っていると思います。これは本当に私自身もすごく似ていて、なんか宇宙の星のようなところに。たくさんの人と一緒に暮らしています。そこに暮らして心を守っています。子供の頃からずっとそうです。うん、の私の命を引き止めてくれました。なので、うん、ポハピピンポポピアという星はすごいシンプルなアイディアですが、多分ものすごく複雑に彼女の心を守るためだけにものすごい世界が作られていると思います。だからきっと守られると思います。Well, maybe I should move on to one more question. Instead of, I mean, unless you'd like to answer that, um, John or, or, or Ginny, whether you'd like to have something. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to my next question about um, um, being a public intellectual. Um, at the beginning of, this really will be my final question. At the beginning of today's event, John, I introduced you as a public intellectual. And I wonder if you can describe what you feel the role of a public intellectual might be. And similarly, Murata-san, your books have sold all over the world. So there is something obviously that touches the core of a lot of people, old and young. I've seen readers' reactions that suggest they feel you've really grasped their situation, that you are speaking for them. And I wonder whether you'd like to comment on what you feel the role of a writer might might be in Japan and in the world. And do you do you see yourself in some sense as a public intellectual? Maybe John first. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I think the role of a public intellectual is to think in public um, and the Second role of the public intellectual is to, is to be informed and to provide context um, for that thought. And I think probably the third role of a public intellectual in the context of literature is to bring forward beautiful and interesting work. Um, we live in a world in which algorithms control a vast amount of what we see and what we know. And so a public intellectual um, really should exist outside of those algorithms to present to people what they don't already know. So one of my happiest moments as an editor was um, being part of the Grant to Japan issue, which Yuka uh, Igarashi completed at, at Granta, and to meet Sahaka Murata in, in Japan um, seven or eight years ago, and to speak to her and to read her work the first time I have since felt very dedicated to publishing it because I feel she is a singular mind and she has a way of telling stories that is unlike anyone on the planet, a very important way. So for me, a, 
being a public intellectual is, is, is finding that which is unique and beautiful and enlarging, enlarging in discussion sense and, and, and bringing it forward. えっと、物語に対して嘘をつかないことだと思っています。私は作小説家は小説の奴隷だというふうに私の大学の頃学んだ学んだ小説の先生がそういう言葉を私に授けてくださいました。小説家はどうしても小説に逆らえない。人間としての私にはできない無意識の無意識だとかそういう部分を使って書いている自分の人生も全部データにして私が今までの人生で見てきたこと無意識の中に中で眠ってることも全部データになって残っています。それは私の意思では意思で取り出せるものではないですが小説を書いているとそこから自然に出てきてそれが作品になって私の作品はいつも私が想像できないどんなに短い短編でも私の人間としての私には想像できないものになるまで書き続けています人間としての私を代弁させるための小説は私はあまりそういう小説も読むのは好きですが私自身は書きませんと私自身の知能を超えた私自身っていう人間の私を超えただけものとしての小説家にしか作れないものになるまで小説文字をずっと繰り返し書いて小説をずっと練っています小説なので誰かのもしかしたらその小説が誰かの代弁者だったり小説を読まれることで完成すると思うので全ての人の中で違った形で完成すると思いますでも私にもこの小説が何なのか人間としての私にはわからないところがたくさ